Greetings. In this video, I'm going to just talk about the, broadly speaking, two different types of federalism. Remember, federal, federalism being a system of divided government. Generally speaking, two types of federalism, dual federalism or cooperative federalism, also known as layer cake federalism and marble cake federalism. Okay. Now, dual federalism or layer cake federalism is a type of a type of federalism where the federal government and the state government have clearly defined areas of power, clearly defined areas of responsibility, and there is no overlapping between the two. Okay, so an example of this might be, let's say, the federal government has power, has the power to provide for the national defense. It alone has that power and the state has nothing to do with it and does nothing in that area of national defense. As an example, to divide it out. Okay, so the national government, the federal government, has this clear distinct power, this clear area of authority, and the state government doesn't have anything to do with it, doesn't have any power in that realm. I'm not saying that's necessarily true in our government. I'm trying to make an example there. Um, here's an example that's true for our government. The power to print money. The federal government has the sole power to print currency. The states cannot print currency. Cool. Um, that would be an example of dual layer federalism. For cooperative federalism or marble cake federalism, the federal and the state government still have areas where one or the other has primary power, maybe, you might say, or primary control. However, that power is somehow shared with the other level of government. There is cooperation, more or less, between the national and the state level governments. Um, lots of programs, um, policies, things like that are carried out under a sort of cooperative federalism model where the federal government says, you know, we're going to fund this, however, we're going to leave it up to the states to implement it or something like that. Um, an example of, uh, kind of a good example, I think, of cooperative federalism would be Medicaid. Medicaid, the um, health insurance program for the uh, poor in this country. Um, the federal government has sort of given a broad definition of what Medicaid is, has devised a formula for setting sort of the Medicaid standards and um, how they're going to divvy up money to the states. However, the states themselves implement the Medicaid program and come up with the very specific rules and regulations of how the Medicaid program will be run in that state. Okay, so the federal government says, we want to fund a Medicaid program. States, if you want to have Medicaid, you can say, we want to have it. We will, the federal government will provide you with money. We'll give you some general guidelines of how you you know, want to implement this program. For example, it's a program to help cover the poor, help them have their health care needs met. However, the states in lots of cases will define what poor is and who meets the criteria for poor to get that Medicaid money or to get covered under the Medicaid program. So that would be one example of cooperative federalism, that Medicaid model. Um, another example, um, and one that I think gets lots of, lots of controversy, um, is education. All right. So the states have primary and, if they want to, more or less sole control over their educational systems. There are certain 
things that each state must do in their educational system solely to sort of satisfy the rights of children. Every single child in this country has a right to an education, but outside of certain like very basic things, such as a certain number of days um, or hours or something like that, that a kid must be provided to be in school or that every kid must be able to be bused to school. So the state has to make sure that every single kid is can be or will be transported to school if they need to be. Otherwise, if they don't do that, they're violating the educational rights of kids. Um, outside of like those very basic things, states have the rest of the control over the education system. However, there is a Department of Education at the federal level. I'm sure lots of people have heard about it. I'm sure lots of people have heard about the controversy for the program known as uh, Common Core. Um, 46, I think, out of the 50 states have accepted the Common Core standards, and here's why. There is absolutely no reason why any state needs to have the Common Core standards, all right? The federal government cannot force any state to adopt Common Core, cannot force any state to implement certain Common Core programs. That is completely voluntary on the state's part. Now, why would the states accept the Common Core program or even accept any federal government power over their education system? Dollars, 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 dollars. The federal government goes, hey, states, we have all this cash right here that we're willing to dole out to y'all. Um, however, in order to get this money, you have to implement this type of program. In this case, the Common Core program I'm talking about. Now, states get money from the federal government for their education programs in other ways, too. But sometimes the federal government has one or maybe multiple different um, programs or curriculum or something like that that they want to try out or see if they work or fund and the states will voluntarily buy into the programs and the federal government will provide the state's money to implement the programs. The states themselves sort of do the implementing of it, but the federal government provides the cash and the guidelines for it. Cool, that would be another example of cooperative federalism. Cool, so we have dual layer federalism and cooperative federalism. Dual layer federalism, also known as layer cake federalism, and cooperative federalism, also known as marble cake federalism. Thanks.